the first uh, question that we have to ask uh, in, uh, on this topic is, is this a hopeless aspiration? Is it old-fashioned? Is it uh, so 20th century? Haven't psychologists shown that humans are irrational? And aren't we living in a post-truth era? So those are the objections that I would like to deal with uh, first in, uh, in uh, arguing for this uh, aspiration. So first off, we are not living in a post-truth era. Why, why aren't we? Well, is the statement, we are living in a post-truth era, true? <laughs> if so, it cannot be true. That is, we are still evaluating propositions based on whether they are true. So we are not in a post-truth era. Likewise, uh, why humans are not irrational. Is the statement, humans are irrational, rational? Uh, if humans were really irrational, who specified the benchmark of rationality against which humans don't measure up? And how did they conduct the comparison? As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, that is, as, as long as you're not bribing or threatening your audience, but trying to persuade them, as soon as you uh, provide reasons why you're right, why other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. And that is why a defensive reason is unnecessary, perhaps even impossible or self-contradictory. So given that we do have the capacity to be rational, why are we so often irrational? And there are a, a number of uh, specific reasons. One of them is the Herb Simon's uh, hypothesis of bounded rationality. We can't process an infinite amount of uh, information uh, instantaneously. We're obviously adapted to an environment that, though reality was a uh, uh, potent selection pressure, uh, we did not evolve with the kind of truth-augmenting technologies that we have developed over the millennia and centuries, such as written language, quantitative data sets, scientific method, hyper-specialization, and uh, expertise. Perhaps even more potently, facts and logic can often compromise our self-presentation as effective and benevolent, which social psychologists have shown to be powerful uh, motives. Um, if you want to convey the impression that you are um, uh, uh, infallible and omniscient and um, thoroughly noble in all respects, then truth and rationality can be kind of a nuisance. Uh, because inevitably, there will be uh, facts that show that you are uh, merely mortal. And a lot of uh, denigration of facts and logic are really just attempts to uh, shore up the advertising campaign uh, for, that we all conduct for ourselves, some of us more than others. The work of Daniel Kahan, which I assume many of you are uh, familiar with, shows that contrary to what most scientists think, a denial of the uh, fact of human evolution or of anthropogenic uh, climate change is not correlated with scientific illiteracy. That many people who believe in uh, human-made climate change are out to lunch uh, when it comes to the science. They'll say things like, uh, you know, helium is a greenhouse gas, radon is a greenhouse gas, global warming is caused by a hole in the ozone layer. We can deal with it by cleaning up toxic waste dumps. And they just have a vague sense of, you know, green and natural and unnatural. Uh, and uh, the ability to predict belief in climate change from scientific literacy is pretty much zero. What does predict it, not quite perfectly, but pretty close, uh, is simply political orientation. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny human-made uh, climate change. Gan points out that there is a perverse rationality of uh, this expressive cognition that is holding beliefs to signal the coalition you belong to. And that is, Unless you're a, uh, one of a small number of movers, shakers, or influencers, your opinion on climate change really doesn't matter. It's really not going to affect the climate. You can think anything you want. However, your opinion on climate change or on evolution or on other issues is going to matter a great deal in terms of how accepted you are in your social circle. Are universities fulfilling their mandate to promote rationality? Well, I'm not going to go over the uh, evidence. I think many people in this room have um, evidence that at least uh, leads us to question the extent to which they have been. Um, so let me start just by putting it into some perspective. Um, I have uh, written 
two books that are largely driven by the observation of Franklin Pierce Adams that the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory. <laughs> so um, I'm, as, as someone who went to uh, university in the 1970s, uh, one, of my, my first, one of my first experiences as a, um, in, in a college freshman in 1972 was seeing the um, card table set up in the lobby of my college by the, I forget whether it was the Socialist Democratic Marxist Leninist Union or the Leninist Marxist Democratic Socialist <laughs> Union. But a student uh, was challenging them as they were handing, handing out uh, papers, uh, their, their newspaper adorned with uh, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, um, Mao. Uh, and I'm, I distinctly remember yelling out, fascists don't have the right to speak. Um, so this is not new. Uh, orthodoxy, intolerance, repression of non-leftist ideas are not an in innovation of the millennials or the Gen, uh, Gen Zs. And in, there are many examples in the 70s and 80s of um, behavioral scientists, including Arthur Jensen, Hans Eysenck, Richard Herrnstein, Thomas Bouchard, Linda Gottfriedson, being deplatformed, disinvited, uh, heckled, shouted down, and in some cases physically assaulted. Just to give you a little souvenir from this uh, era, here's a poster from 1984. Come in here, Edward O. Wilson, uh, who John uh, uh, noted in his introduction, sociobiologist and the prophet of right-wing patriarchy. Then at the bottom uh, of the poster, it says, bring noisemakers. <laughs> so uh, it is not new, although um, I don't doubt that uh, it has been getting worse. So by, by, by saying that, that uh, this occurred when, when I was a student, it doesn't mean that we should be unconcerned or that nothing has changed. Um, the uh, other... Uh, danger of allowing universities to, to fester in intolerance and uh, dogma and repression is that uh, it can lead to perverse backlashes. Uh, that in, in many ways, the regressive left is an incubator of the alt-right. And I have seen this happen, including to my uh, shock and some of my own former students, that when they uh, see certain opinions being just unexpressible, when they see student uh, speakers being uh, deplatformed, people being um, assaulted, um, demonized, um, a natural conclusion is you can't handle the truth. That there must be hidden truths that university that are just too uncomfortable to be voiced or discussed in universities, and as a result, the the uh, only option is simply to withdraw into an alternative universe of understanding. And since that alternative universe can have the uh, opposite of the current dogmas, but without any of the qualifications, uh, nuances, counter-evidence uh, context, can often um, uh, metastasize in, in rather uh, destructive forms. I'll just so to sum up, I've suggested that we, uh, we must safeguard the truth and rationality promoting mission of universities. It's feasible because we are not living in a post-truth era and humans are not always irrational. The rational angels of our nature must be encouraged by truth-promoting norms and institutions. Many are succeeding, despite uh, perhaps growing rationality inequality. Universities may be falling short of their rationality-promoting mission. This mi mission nonetheless matters for society to enjoy the benefits of rationality in return for the perquisites it grants to universities, to secure the credibility of university-based research on vital issues and to prevent backlashes of irrationality. Do you find within the university campus setting, is it, is it professors or is it students who are the fomenters of, you know, a turn away from rational discourse, away from truth or, or, or approaching objective truth? Uh, you know, I think among professors, who, are, who, who, are, who obviously I have uh, more acquaintance with, um, it's, I think there is some, pl some pluralistic ignorance that I think in private, many professors will say things that are completely, um, by our lights, reasonable. That is, uh, uh, acknowledging the value of objecti objectivity, truth, knowledge, all that stuff. Uh, but then when it comes to public arenas, they're all afraid to do it because they're all afraid they'll, they'll get, they won't be able to defend it if for forced to. Um, I, and among students, um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, there are, again, I, uh, I'm hesitant to say without a, a good sampling of the uh, privately stated opinions of students. And I'm hesitant to generalize from my own experience because I don't know what kind of students gravitate to me that come to my office hours. In general, 
the, uh, I don't find among the students that I speak to in dinners and office hours have these um, uh, intolerant uh, beliefs. Mm -hmm. But I may, I'm, I may be getting a bias sample or maybe it's a bias sample that are making the headlines. I don't know which of those is, is right. If there are open channels of communication, if there aren't self-contained um, communities where the interactions are uh, tightly knit, but that there are long distance connections. So that people from outside a community are, uh, their opinions can be sampled rather than just the people you rub shoulders with. Uh, if there is more openness and uh, more little boys uh, uh, pointing out the, the, the uh, uh, state of dress of the emperor, uh, those are ways of, of deflating these, these uh, bubbles. Uh, but another big factor, this goes also to something that, that um, Nick was asking. Um, I think uh, the huge danger in combating the intolerance, the repression, and so on, is to uh, make it seem like it's a right-wing issue. Because that will only stoke it, that if you're a, uh, a respectable member of the, uh, the, the left or even the, the, the non-right, um, then if you, will, if you re react or recoil from a movement that you see as aligned with, uh, you know, ultimately Donald Trump or the alt right, then that will just push people um, uh, even uh, farther along to become, make them even more uh, entrenched and resistant. So, one just as with um, climate change, the worst thing that happened to that movement was when uh, it became a left wing issue. When uh, some people date it to Al Gore uh, producing an inconvenient truth being a Democratic presidential candidate and former vice president. Uh, he kind of stamped it with, with a, a left-wing aroma, um, leading to greater polarization. Uh, if that happens to free speech, heterodoxy, um, open inquiry, um, then, then it's going to get worse.